bar and space bar will drop it down and you'll monitor the chat. Perfect. Okay, guys, uh, welcome to tonight's session. Um, tonight we're joined by Dr. JC Hodge. He's an ENT specialist from the Royal Adelaide Hospital and also works privately at the Memorial and does an outreach program to Port Augusta, which is a small country town in South Australia. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, tinnitus and its assessment and management and general practice and some novel ways that JC is looking at this moving into the future. Um, if you have any questions along the way, just put it into the chat box. Uh, JC is more than happy to be interrupted along the way and answer those questions. Um, you can either, that's probably the easiest, but it, you can also unmute and, and talk to us that way if you want to. So uh, thanks so much, JC. Thanks for joining us. And I'll pass you over. Hi there. So, um, yep, South Australian ENT doctor. Um, there we go. Um, so these are my four main research interests. Tinnitus, you can see the you know, head and neck pathology, robotics, snoring, OSA, acute surgical airway management. They're all involved me with a knife in my hand. Uh, tinnitus is unusual. You won't see many uh, ENT doctors who have a um, research interest in this, but because I do so much head and neck pathology, I see a lot of cancer and over the years, a lot of my patients um, complain of tinnitus, mostly through side effects of radiation treatment, uh, from autotoxins, uh, uh, from chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, the usual party line is put up with it, you know, treat the underlying anxiety that it causes. Um, and, th and then uh, that was it. So, um, what I what I've developed are sort of uh, treatment programs uh, for patients with tinnitus, really focusing on first of all quality of life, um, because it's very hard to treat someone for a condition where you can't you can't grade it. So you can have ten people in the room who all say they've got tinnitus. You need to know whether this is having a significant impact on their uh, quality of life, uh, mental health assessments, and you need to be able to do that in a way that's quick, reproducible. And also you need to look at you know, all, the whole bunch of treatment options of which acoustic desensitization is, is the new kid on the block. And, and really I'll talk to you a bit about that as well. So I'll talk to you about tinnitus and its definition. This, this talk is really geared towards patients with uh, non-pulsatile tinnitus. Um, that's a whole new, uh, that's a whole different ball game. Um, and I'll go through uh, my eight point tinnitus treatment plan. So this encompasses all uh, assessment and investigation and treatment in a way that's fairly methodical. Um, I'll just show you a few online tools for uh, GPs and managing tinnitus. I've got a, a website that um, looks at this, that also you can access the 5Q, which is the novel uh, quality of life questionnaire for tinnitus, and also goes through a, a GP treatment algorithm you can download, which basically encompasses this talk on, a, on an A4 sheet and, and gives you a structure through which you can approach tinnitus. And, uh, and then I'll finish off. So tinnitus is uh, the perception of sound without ex any external stimuli. It is extremely common, 20% of adult Australians, so that's 4 million people, um, mostly idiopathic. So the, you know, looking at the studies, two thirds to 98%, we never find an underlying cause. There are some well-documented underlying causes that you should probably look for, you know, noise exposure, traumatic brain injuries, neurodegenerative conditions, autotoxins, um, anxiety obviously has a large uh, role to play in managing tinnitus both as a cause and uh, as an aggravator. Um, as we speak, there are 1.5 billion people with tinnitus around the world. I mean, the numbers are, are just out, uh, outstanding. And at any one point in time, everyone in, us, everyone in the world would experience tinnitus. So it, its incidence is 100%. There are some groups that are going to get it more through environmental exposure. So um, Army, um, in the US last year, there were 1 million successful claims for tinnitus from the Department of Veteran Affairs. 1 million successful claims. I mean, the numbers are staggering. 50% of musicians will have tinnitus, obviously people in the mining industry, and uh, a lot of work now. So this is a picture of uh, two guys in the NFL. Um, a lot of work's been done that has come out of the States through contact sport. Um, looking at uh, concussion and now also looking at noise induced hearing loss. So when those two helmets bang together, the noise they produce internally is enormous. And now also looking at tinnitus as a result of head injury and also noise induced, um, noise -induced tinnitus. Um, tinnitus doesn't respect socioeconomic barriers, cultural barriers. It has a massive uh, psychosocial impact. Uh, so this is Van Gogh. 
Um, everyone knows he committed suicide, but the reason he committed suicide is because he had tinnitus and he just couldn't bear it. So he took the ultimate step. He cut off his own ear. And the reason he did that wasn't because he was mad. He did it because he thought if he cut off his ear, it would get rid of his tinnitus because it was an ear symptom. And he killed himself when he realized he'd mutilated himself and it had made no difference to his tinnitus. Um, now, 2% of tinnitus sufferers are severe and one in 10 to one in 20 of those will have an attempt at suicide, you know, which is just a staggering number. So my eight point tinnitus treatment plan would encompass everything I think you need to know, obviously um, in giving you a methodical framework in which to work through um, tinnitus. So I'm um, looking at an examination and examination really it also has to encompass a hearing test and a quality of life score, a mental health assessment, looking at autotoxing, looking at sleep, looking at your diet, whether manipulation of mineral vitamin deficiencies and looking at supplements, whether, whether they're useful, uh, noise exposure, which is, you know, you know, ongoing noise exposure as a, as a, as a, as something that needs to be looked at. And then looking at some musculoskeletal triggers and then looking at various types of sound therapy. Can I ask yep. a question? Uh, the vitamin, any particular deficiency or that we should measure? Yeah, or? so, well, I, you don't necessarily have to measure them and I'll talk about this in a bit, but essentially magnesium, zinc and B12 are the biggest ones. And then there are supplements that can be given outside of that. And that includes things like turmeric, ginkgo, garlic, melatonin. Um, most of those are witchcraft based, no real evidence for them. Um, but uh, magnesium, zinc and beta 12, there is a bit of work on those. Now you can test for those, but um, you know, if someone's cramping at nighttime, you know, they're probably gonna be low magnesium. People doing a lot of weight will be low magnesium. Uh, vegans, obviously beta 12 is an animal product. Zinc is found in a lot of animal products as well. So people who, you know, who have vegan diets, um, you can look at supplementing that. Inflammatory bowel disease, pernicious and anemia, beta 12 deficiencies, those sort of things, yeah. Um, um, and then sound therapy. And I'll basically, I'm gonna go through those one at a time now. So your ear examination, you're looking for a con essentially, you know, a conductive hearing loss, because if you've got a conductive hearing loss, you do not hear environmental sounds as loud and your tinnitus becomes louder. So that's the easiest fix in the world. You know, someone who's got a bit of background tinnitus, which comes really loud and you look in the ear and it's full of wax and you get rid of the wax and it's an instant fix. It's extremely rewarding, but uh, to panic membrane perforations, and then acicular issues. So someone who's got a conductive hearing loss on your audiology um, with a normal examination, they may well have otosclerosis and treating that can help with the tinnitus. Um, the audiology helps with that, but also it helps you discern patients who may have a symmetrical, reasonable central neural hearing loss that may benefit from hearing aids. Again, giving them hearing aids increases that environmental sound and helps tinnitus during the day. Or if they've got asymmetrical central neural hearing loss, you know, do they need a referral for looking for a lateral cause? So um, the trigger for an MRI scan in asymmetrical central neural hearing loss is more than 10 decibels between two consecutive frequencies. So when you get a hearing test, you can do that hearing test on 10 consecutive days. It's always going to be a bit different. So you're allowed five decibels either way, test, retest, error. So if uh, more than 10 or not on two consecutive frequencies, the, you know, that really needs an MRI scan. And then we're going to look at quality of life questionnaires. So I grew up in the, in the, in the UK um, where we use the Tintus Handicap Questionnaire and the Tintus Handicap Index. They take about six minutes. I've never seen those used in a meaningful way in an ENT clinic in 20 years. They were only validated for initial assessments. They're not follow-up tools. Then there's the tinnitus um, functional index, which is, which is used in Australia. That's a slightly more modern uh, version, um, which is validated again for initial assessment and follow-up, but again, takes six minutes or so. And, and, and most clinics do not have six minutes to spend going through a, a TFI. And the five Q is, is a quality of life questionnaire that I developed that is, uh, takes less than a minute, five simple questions. And it's been validated against the THQ and the THI, both and, and also validated for follow-up. So it essentially asks five questions and it's based on uh, the previous week. And you score naught means it doesn't bother you, 10 is a disaster. And it looks at whether it affects, tinnitus affects your hearing, your sleep, your concentration, your ability to relax and your day-to-day -day activities. We then times it by two, and that gives you a percentage because people can get the head, you know, intuitively, you know, a, what a percentage means. And then in 20% increment bands, you either have slight, mild, moderate, severe, or catastrophic uh, tinnitus. 
Um, it's got a very high positive correlation with the TH9, THQ. It's much more responsive than those two questionnaires at six week uh, interval repeat measurements. It's rapid, so it's a really good screening tool when someone comes in and you're busy and you wanna know whether that tinnitus is significant or not. You can also target the dominant symptomatology because you know if they score nine in sleep and rest of twos and threes, your, your focus in treatment and your treatment goal should really be targeting in that sleep and getting them to sleep and working out what strategies you can use. It, it helps you guide the aggressivity of, of management. And what I mean by that, if someone is, has got mild tinnitus, then I like to implement strategies or, or interventions one at a time so you can see which one's working. But if someone comes in and they've got severe or catastrophic tinnitus, you really want to throw the kitchen sink at them. And it allows you to monitor response. You know, if someone comes in and they're severe and you do something to change, you do an intervention, you, you want to see them next week and repeat that and see if it's made a difference. Now, the mental health assessment, I think this is the cornerstone of successful tinnitus treatment. We do it very poorly as ENT. Um, but really, um, anyone who I score a 5Q greater than 60, I send straight back to the GP so they can have um, a, a mental health assessment and management. And essentially, not just for tinnitus, but I tell all my patients who've got a chronic condition, so anything more than three months, often idiopathic, because then there's always that element of doubt that the doctors are missing something. And with the treatment options are limited, that has to have an impact on your mental health. And until you get that management right, any other management geared towards that to the underlying condition is really, I think, doomed to fail. Uh, autotoxins, you, need, you just need to do a brief history here. Normally self-explanatory, uh, most we don't use anymore. For me, the ones I see commonly are the cancer medications. Cispatin especially, is, it's, uh, it's a pig for the ear. It causes central profound situational hearing loss and tinnitus. Methotrexate, less so. You know, I don't see that very often. Antibiotics, really gentamicin is, is the key here for us, but it, it's mostly interestingly a vestibular toxic rather than cochlear toxic. So you tend not to get too much tinnitus with it. Vancomycin, that's, that's a low risk and erythromycin is a very low risk. Uh, loop diuretics, uh, quinines, um, you probably won't use quinines anymore. I mean, I used to use it back when I was an intern for, um, uh, you know, for a night cramping that came off the market, I think in 2006, due to significant hematological uh, conditions, very high dose aspirin and anti-inflammatories. Interestingly for the, for the NSAIDs, um, if you overdose on these, you, like, you overdose on urethane, you'll, you'll get tinnitus, but it's reversible. So when the overdose wears off, the tinnitus tends to go with it. And we don't know why that is. Um, sleep. Now sleep's critical. Because if you don't sleep properly, everything, uh, your ability to cope with anything uh, goes down the pan. Um, and tinnitus is a potent um, negator of good quality sleep because you're worrying about it. And also your environmental sounds come down so you're, you can hear your tinnitus louder. Um, so there's a few strategies you can use. The first is, is really, mark, this is where I think masking comes into its own. And you can use, people use, um, you know, fans, you know, listen to radio. Um, you can listen either on just a speaker, Yui Boom or something like that. But if you've got a partner who doesn't want to listen to these sort of noises, you can use sleep headphones. Um, these you can buy over the internet. They're designed for jogging. They're comfortable. They're cheap, you know, 20 to 50 bucks. They've got good Bluetooth connectivity. The batteries last eight hours. You know, they're not pumping out good quality music at high volume, but you don't need that. Um, and I tend to recommend people use pink noise. Now, white noise is static. So, you know, between radio stations on old analog radios, and that's random frequencies at the same intensity. Uh, pink noise is low frequency sound. So that starts at a, a frequency and for every a certain intensity frequency. And every time you half the frequency, you, you, um, you, you, um, you half the intensity. So in nature, that's a rustling leaves, it's rainwater. Now, there's a lot of work being done on pink noise and, and just sleep quality. So if you look at sleep studies and people exposed to rainwater and pink noise, they sleep better. They get better quality REM sleep. They get more REM sleep. And we've all experienced that. So if, I'm, if it's raining outside, I get a great night's sleep. But also there's, a, there's some evidence that pink noise in connection with tinnitus is even more advantageous. Whereas interestingly, white noise, there's, there's a bit of evidence in the literature now that it may be an aggravator of tinnitus in the long term. And it's a little bit controversial, so I tend to sort of stick to pink noise now. And you can get that, uh, and that's free. So if you've got a Spotify account, if you've got an Apple account, 
you just put in pink noise playlist or, or, or raining playlist and you'll get a whole playlist you can play. Um, and melatonin. So we talked about supplements earlier, but melatonin independently, there is some evidence that it's, it, that it's good for uh, tinnitus. Um, you know, for every trial that shows it's good, there's one that shows it's not so good, but it's also, it's, you know, it's, it's good to get back into circadian rhythm, help you get to sleep. So it's a sort of dual action that I like to use for tinnitus. And obviously now in Australia, above the age of 55, you can buy this yourself over the counter. So dietary supplements we touched on. Um, I, look, I, I, I have asked those screening questions I mentioned about cramping, diet, uh, GI issues. And if, if it, those are negative, then I don't necessarily replace those. You can you know, actually check magnesium, beta 12 levels. Zinc, I'm not sure how accurate that is when you do biochemistry on it. And then there's all these other uh, supplements which are, um, you know, a lot of people will swear by them, but there's no, there's no good evidence for these. Uh, ginkgo, garlic, turmeric. Um, you can imagine the problem with, with tinnitus and research is that tinnitus goes up and down and you've got 1.5 billion people on the planet with tinnitus. You give them all turmeric, some are going to get better and then it'll be because of the turmeric, but it's just because your, your tinnitus was going to get better anyway. And most of the studies don't, um, you know, don't take that into account, unfortunately. Just one, one question yep. around, does B6 overuse cause an issue? Uh, I don't know. Actually, is the short answer to that. I'll have to look, look that up and uh, I'll uh, get back to you. Um, I've not come across that in my practice or, or, or any of the research in the last couple of years. So that probably means not, but there, there's, there's most, most drugs will have that as a potential side effect. But it's, if it is, it's going to be extremely rare, I think. And what about the uh, COVID vaccine? Isn't there a yeah. few things coming out about... Yeah. Pfizer creating tinnitus? Yeah, there's been a bit, yeah, it, it's hard. And I, and I did a YouTube uh, channel video on this because essentially, you know, the COVID itself can cause significant harm, as we all know. And then there's a the theoretical, very small risk of getting tinnitus from the vaccine. But I think that is grossly outweighed by the benefits of getting the mm. vaccine and getting COVID. And that was the message I put across when I talked about this. Um, I mean, I saw a patient today and, and the problem is with the vaccine is the new syphilis of med medical school, isn't it? I remember being in med school, every time I would ask a question, I didn't know the answer, I'd say syphilis. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now you can say COVID vaccine and you can say COVID. So you've got yeah. three answers you can give. And I saw a patient today who said, oh, you know, my tinnitus came from my COVID vaccine. It you was know, two days later. So essentially, you know, within a week of getting the COVID vaccine, you can, you know, people are blaming anything that happens. You know. 20% of the adult population have got COVID, have got, have got a, a tinnitus. Yeah. So, th th so there's no data to support that, but I'm, you know, you know, every symptom I saw today, someone brought up the COVID vaccine for. Yeah. So I, I think um, when patients ask me about this, and, and it's often patients who've, in, in, in their in defense, it's patients who've had tinnitus and that it's been really awful for them. And then they're reading this thing about the COVID vaccine. And they're going, well, I'm, I almost put a bullet in my head last time I had tinnitus. So I'll take COVID over that. Yeah. You know, can you guarantee me it won't cause it? And the answer is, well, no, I can't. But there's yeah. no good data to support yeah. it. You know, it's a good question. So noise exposure. Um, this, is, this is interesting because we know noise exposure and hearing loss is, is, is a thing. Um, but we don't know about no and we know the levels that that happens at so essentially if you're looking at work and health and safety levels is 85 decibels for eight hours will, will cause uh, can cause hearing loss and then for every three decibels above 85 decibel you half the exposure so 88 decibels for four hours 91 for two hours and that gives you an idea of noise exposure but what what there's very little um data on is noise exposure that isn't severe enough to cause hearing loss but can cause tinnitus. And I think that's a real entity and we've got no levels for that, unfortunately. But I tell patients who've got pre-existing tinnitus that you know, you've got to be mindful that further noise exposure on a fragile acoustic system is probably gonna make it worse. Um, interestingly, so for us really in our modern world, that's, that's listening to music, it's, it's smartphones. Um, now I'm an Apple person, so I don't know how this works on Android. I'm sure it's the same, but if you go to, there are noise level uh, settings on your on your smartphone interesting so if you go to settings sounds and happiness there's a headphone safety section and you can click it on and you can you can put 85 decibels so you will not hear noise louder than 85 decibels on your on your uh, on your listening device on your on your headphones and you can tick a box that or a, you click something that basically reduces loud sounds and you can set that 
um, and you can turn on headphone notifications. So it will tell you, you've been exposed to X amount of noise for this time, you've got to be careful. Um, and I think that's a really good tool, especially for teenagers who obviously aren't going to listen to their parents, but they'll, 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 they'll listen to notifications. Um, musculoskeletal triggers, um, this is really about TMJ. So um, cervical spine issues will cause disequilibrium. I see that a lot, cervicogenic disequilibrium. And some uh, uh, feedback from patients, again, on some, some YouTube channels I run, with, which end up being sort of forums for discussions on tinnitus. Um, there's a few that say, you know, when the neck goes out, they get tinnitus, they fix the neck and the tinnitus gets better. But I think that's quite unusual. Um, TJ, TMJ dysfunction, though, that's a whole new ball game. Um, people with significant TMJ dysfunction, 30% of those, if you treat them, the tinnitus get significantly better. And so there are neural pathways there. Um, and you can assess TMJ dysfunction clinically, you know, you can palpate the TMJ joint. Often that doesn't, you know, you can have TMJ dysfunction without having an arthropathy. So I tend to examine the teeth first because teeth are meant to be rounded in both directions. And if they've shorn off like a sheep, you know that patient has ground their teeth at some point, which is the biggest cause of TMJ dysfunction. And then I actually feel for the muscles of mastication because if they're sore, then that means they're actively grinding and you should target that TMJ as a potential source for the tinnitus. Because your muscles of mastication basically shouldn't be sore. It's like going to pressing your, your biceps, it doesn't hurt. If you go to the gym, you know, punch out 50, um, 50 uh, barbell curls, then, you know, you, you, the next morning your muscles hurt. And it's the same with people grinding the teeth or not. And most people don't report that. Then, you know, they say, oh, no, I don't grind my teeth. But you can feel for the medial natural pterygoids in the mouth and, you know, they'll, they'll hit the ceiling. And the treatment for that is a dental plate to take the pressure off the jaw at night time. And I've had quite a bit of success with that. So it's, it, is, it is worth uh, um, uh, looking for that. And also it's a cause of headaches and dental pain and referred otalgia and all these other things you see in ENT. Um, so sound therapy, so, the, so the, other than the quality of life, this is one of my research interests. So masking sounds is, is obviously sound therapy. Um, hearing aids, excellent for that. Masking devices during the day, I think are hopeless because if you've got normal hearing, putting something in your ear that's making more sound, um, that's you know, broad-based sound, most people just don't tolerate it. Because, you know, it, it interferes with their interaction with the environment. Um, at night time, I, I do like it, pink noise in particular, as we've discussed, um, because I think it improves your quality of sleep as well as masking your tinnitus. Um, <clears throat> so acoustic desensitization is, is, is what I've sort of worked on over these last few years. So I call this acoustic red uh, head rub. And we, th this, is, this is basic neurophysiology. Um, so if you bang your head, you rub it and it feels better. And that's a little bit counterintuitive, but in the brain, there's a map of the human body called the homunculus. And it looks like a distorted fetus because it's overrepresented in those areas which have a lot of sensory inputs, so you know, big lips and, and, and fingers and toes. Um, so that forehead you know, lights up red and flashes and your brain goes, okay, and you've hurt yourself. And then you rub it and it drowns that area out with non-painful stimuli. And the brain looks and says, well, listen, I get it. Nothing, nothing bad's going on. And it turns the gain down. So the pain gets better. Um, that's one of the mechanisms by which sinus surgery works for migraine or, or, or mid facial pain. So people end up getting you know, 15 sinus operations, even though they've, they've never had sinus sinus because their pain goes for a while. Um, if you go through a past a kid's playground and you see a kid fall over and they get up and they, they bang the knee and they rub it and it gets better. Now, the reason we can't do this for tinnitus is because you can't detect your own tinnitus frequency and you can't auto generate. Um, sound as a, as a, as a narrow band treatment sound around that frequency. But with modern technology, it's really easy. And, and that's one of the programs I've developed. It's on Android and Apple. You know, it's TJ approved as a digital med uh, medical device. And you can use any platform. You know, you can use you know, your computer, laptop, iPhone, whatever works, and, and headphones or in-ear phones. Now, originally, this was designed to use during the day, um, but you can use it at night time. And, and it's a bit like getting a... Uh, gym membership it's sort of you know you've got to turn up for it to work if you're retired the daytime's fine because you you don't have to listen to it your, 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 your acoustic system has to listen to it. your brain's got to listen to it so you can walk the dog you can do some gardening with your headphones in and listen to listen to the noise and, and, and that'll be fine um, the trial data i'm about to show you that was a, a daytime trial uh, over six weeks um, you sort of need people with a single frequency, which is a, the majority of patients with tinnitus, but you do get some people with multiple frequencies. If there's a dominant one, you can target that. If it's fleeting and it's high pitch and low pitch and this and it's that, then you, you're never going to win with those. Um, 
So um, you want to aim for about two hours a day, which sounds like a lot, but that's the, you know that's you know uh, you know when you when you're doing other stuff, you know that goes pretty quick. It's locked out at four hours, because some people get a lot of benefit from this, and then it becomes this sort of OCD, and, and they're using it too much. And I was worried that overuse would then lead to noise-induced tinnitus, which is what we're trying to uh, 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 treat. And there's a sleep version because you, you're, and, and that's for people who are basically busy during the day, because there's no way you can spend two hours listening to acoustic desensitization sounds. But at night time you're sleeping, so that's dead time. And your auditory system still works. That's why you wake up and the dog barks, or the door bangs, and you can use it with the pre-treatment sounds. So I like using, as I said, pink noise to start with, drift peak patients up to sleep, and then the treatment sound comes in over two hours, softly, softly, reaches a peak and then goes down again. And, and really without waking patients. So that's a, you know, that, that's a really neat way of getting it in for people who are time poor, which is basically everyone. Now, this is the, the data from that initial trial. Essentially, every group statistically got better by the slight group. And this is, this is actually interesting. So when I went back and looked at all the various trials, when I'm looking at trials for anything to do with tinnitus and they're using quality of life questionnaires to grade it, which is sort of what you need to do, otherwise you don't know if it's getting better or not. Um, slight, this is what you see in the slight groups is quite, oh, where am I going? And um, this is quite common. So most trials now exclude the slight group because it's a really flip, flip of a coin whether you get them better or worse. So this group got better, you know, 0 0.8, 0 cent, which is you know, meaningless, but all the other groups got better. Generally, the worse you are, the more dramatic the benefits for treatment. And that goes for any treatment for tinnitus, really. Um, so excluding that slight group, there's a 73.4% 70, you know, improvement over that six week period. Um, obviously some people get worse as well. This is running away from me, what have I done? Um, I think I was, uh, I was born up in France, my hands go everywhere and I've been rubbing them over the mouse, which keeps <laughs> triggering the talk. So I'll, I'll try and be more English and uh, hold my hands politely. Um, no, that's not working. So um, we looked at, what interested me was what were there any factors that can determine you know which patients are you more likely to get better with with tinnitus treatment and actually low frequency patients that was the that was statistically significant below 2000 hertz and the reason for that is if you get someone to identify their, their tinnitus frequency if it's low frequency they're within 50 hertz of it it's really very accurate but when you go to the high frequency above 2000 hertz and people are out by about 6,900 hertz. So there's an element of patients who really aren't, probably aren't choosing the right tinnitus frequency. So you still get results, you still get positive results, but they're not, they're not quite as good. You can see the mean improvement, it, it, it was statistically in, better for the low frequency. Um, and I looked at a whole bunch of other stuff. So I just wondered whether if people didn't have tinnitus for a long time, so you look at the literature, it says if you've not had tinnitus for long, you're more likely to get rid of it. Because you've had it for a long time, you're stuffed, it's never gonna get better. Um, but we, there was a trend towards that over 10 years of having tinnitus, but we couldn't prove it. Uh, and in fact, the, the mean respond, the responders, the mean duration, it was 11 years. So it's not a conscious, you get patients who says, you know, I've had this for as long as I can remember. You can still treat them. Non-responders, 14 years, but there was, there was trend, there was, it was a trend, but not significant. And same with gender. So females tended to get more of those got better, but they started with a high baseline, which probably warped the figures a bit. And then I wondered whether it was listening time, but in fact, that made no difference. So even the patients who, who didn't get better or got worse, they were still using an appropriate and the same amount of time. So there's some online tools um, that you can use because it is, you know, when you Google Tinters, it is just, an, it just a, it's a, fat, it's a bottomless pit of, of information. Most of it's sort of meaningless and, and, and witchcraftery. Um, this is a website that I've come up with. You can access, so there's, there will be some tabs at the top and you can go to the five cues. You can do that with the patient or you can download it. Um, and at the end, the first time you do that, there'll be, there's a GP treatment algorithm, which I'll now show you, but you can download that. So at least you've got a template that you can use that will work you through basically what I've just talked about. Um, and I've got a YouTube channel, which I use for patients because it encompasses all sorts of things like and really short, sharp talks on my diet, um, looking at sound therapy, looking at my hearing loss, noise exposure, all those things we've talked about, but put in a way that patients can access um, and, and ask questions that I can then sort of respond to. Um, so it, it, this is slightly distorted because I work on a Mac, but essentially, as you can see, there's an initial assessment, which is what we talked about. You know, you, you've got to bang out the 5Q and I put it down there for you as well. 
I've listed the autotoxin because it's you know that might be something just as a memory trigger. Um, you know, we talk about diet, sleep, all these things, and you can just work through it bit by bit. Um, obviously, in a pure term autogram, mental health assessment, you know, that really the eight points that I mentioned. And then um, what to refer. So if you look to the left of the screen, um, pulsed dull tinnitus, conductive hearing loss, unilateral tinnitus, and asymmetrical central hearing loss, you need to refer to the ENT for further investigations. Unilateral tinnitus is probably a bit of a fudge. Um, we, we were, we, we're taught, and, you know, I'm an examiner for the college, and you know, unilateral tinnitus you have to refer, but if the, the hearing test is symmetrical, the chance of there being an acoustic neuroma, which is what you're looking for with an MRI scan for asymmetrical central hearing loss, that's only caused tinnitus and, and, and no, not a single degree of central hearing loss, that's going to be zero. So, and most people, if you really push them, will say, well, I guess I'll get it a bit in the other ear as well, because it is a central process. And, and all the other things, essentially, there's, there's no need. So non pulsatile bilateral tinnitus, patients with normal hearing, patients with symmetrical central hearing loss, albeit that they made it from hearing aids, um, you know, you've reviewed the medication, um, and, and really they don't, they don't need a referral if you've worked through that eight-point uh, tinnitus treatment plan. And then patients with a 5Q, so if they're 20 or more, then they benefit from acoustic desensitization. Um, below that, I, I just, I don't think I'd bother. And even the patients who are mild, I normally say, listen, before you go down this route, why don't you, um, let, let's go through the chat. And there's normally a few things that you found that they'll benefit from, whether it's sleep or diet or TMJ. So, so you tend to knock those off first one by one, um, I think, before you, you, you go down the acoustic desensitization route. So I think just to finish off, it's really important you do a quality of life questionnaire. You can do the more, more, more thorough ones, but let's say that the 5Q, we're just about to publish this in Clinical Toll, that's validated and for initial assessment and follow-up. And only the TFI does that as well. Work your way through the A-point treatment, uh, uh, treatment, uh, tinnitus treatment plan, and then have acoustic desensitization um, up your sleeve as a modern treatment that's been shown to work. Um, bearing in mind that it doesn't matter how long you've had tinnitus, and you can still desensitize patients to that to that frequency. Excellent. So, Thanks that. so much, JC. That was that was great. I mean, tinnitus is something I really struggle with uh, every day in uh, it clinics. Comes, yeah, it is it is really common. Um, and so to actually have a framework now to, to work my way through that is is actually really beneficial. And, and mostly when you go through it, the answers are no. So you can actually, you can really focus down on the, on, on the problem. And, and most people would be no, 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 no. Yes, yeah, sleep's a big problem. Yeah. And the quality of life is quite good, good for that as well. Yeah. You know, if they're scoring 60 or more, that's the patient who's in trouble. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that really, need, you need to pay a bit of attention to that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right about those tinnitus assessment scales. Like no one's going to spend six minutes assessing someone with... I've never seen it used in 20 years in the yeah. NT clinic. No. Never seen it used. And we so, talk, and even as a research... So if you look at all the research on tinnitus, um, uh, the, the fallout rate is enormous. Yeah. Because patients get on the trial to get the treatment and they do the, the TFI and the THQ. And they got told you need to do this on a weekly basis. The dropout's enormous. You end up with no patients on your trial yeah. because they just won't. They just yeah. won't play the play game. We had fifty percent dropout. Yeah. No, finished the trial, did the five Q, got to do the other, and we never got those back because I just went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. done now. Yeah. Well, I might I might arrange actually for us to download that framework and send it through to the clinics yeah. so that it's you can be <clears> uploaded <throat> onto best practice for people. I think that'd be beneficial. Yeah. Well, do, a few questions, do we? Yeah. Can you do that as well? Yeah, so I'll, yeah. I'll, look, I'll look up the B6. I just need to, to check that. I'm not sure about that. Um, so you can actually, so the website I've got www.tinnitustreatment.com.au. You can access all those. Uh, you can access acoustic desensitization there, and and it's good for patients because it enables them to also track. They can before they do anything, they can find their tinnitus frequency. There's also there's different sounds. There's different sounds. So, you know, we're talking about a pure tone is a sinusoidal wave, but also there's dirtier sounds, you know, there's the there's sawtooth, there's square, there's peg waves. So they can identify a sound that's closer to their tinnitus because it makes it easier for them to identify it. Um, and so they can access that through. And also they need to be able to hear the sound. So, you know, if your tinnitus, if your hearing loss is absolutely awful and you're, you know, severe to profound, it's very hard to then provide a sound shrimp sound that they can hear above that without absolutely blasting them you know with 110 decibels so you know they've, they've got to have reasonable hearing but reasonable hearing is still like a moderate loss you know is fine 
Um, it is age dependent. So there is so little work done on kids. It's really disappointing because I think a lot of kids have tinnitus, but they just, no one, you know, any of my kids would say, I've got some noise. You just go, yeah, 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 yeah whatever, sure, sure, sure. But actually it's really common and it's poorly understood. Um, and um, I know virtually no trials on children with tinnitus. So in, in the trial we did, so the TGA approved, but for the age of 18 and above, because um, it, it's just really, it, it was just, it was too hard otherwise. And also you're dealing with, you know, a, an immature auditory system. And I don't know what prolonged noise exposure does. I mean, we've got these figures for adults for hearing loss, but I've got no figures for creating tinnitus in, 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 a, in a pediatric brain. I think you're on a sticky wicket using um, acoustic desensitization. And imaging prior to referral. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, so I image, um, the, the short answer is uh, yes. And also if it's normal, then you, because you're sort of referring, you're referring patients who've got, um, you know, so for conductive hearing loss, the answer is, um, is no. Um, I would occasionally CT scan these prior to stabilectomy, which I don't do, but if I'm referring it onto someone, and most stabilectomy surgeons probably do need a CT, but not always. So, so I wouldn't do it from a, from a GP point of view. For pulse dial tinnitus or asymmetrical hearing loss, you're referring it on to get an MRI scan, essentially, to, to get a tick boss, because if it comes through the specialist, obviously, it is, um, it, it, you know, you, it, from the patient's perspective, it is cheaper. But that's all they're really coming for. And the examination is, you know, it, you know, pulse dial tinnitus then also needs a good examination, feeling the neck, but, um, you know, looking in the ear to make sure there's not a high riding you know, jugular vein or um, vascular tumor, a, a gl a glomus, these sort of things. Um, but if they've got asymmetrical hearing loss only and it's non pulse dial tinnitus and you get an MRI scan and it's normal, you're sort of done right because those eight points you should go through. I mean, I go through those eight points with my, my patients. I can guarantee you other ENT surgeons not going through the eight point. You know, they're going, yeah, MRI's fine, get out. And, and that's unfortunately, you know, you know, when you've got a surgical specialty dealing with a non-surgical problem, you, you know, you don't, I don't think patients get a good service because they just get brushed off and they can't help you. I can't cut it out. And also it, it's been a dearth of research for that reason. You know, it's under the, it's under the, um, not control, but it's, it's, it's a bunch of surgeons and they're not, not interested in looking after tinnitus, it's the harsh reality. So I think if you can get hold of an MRI scan, you know, for asymmetrical hearing loss and it's normal, bearing in mind that 99% are going to be normal, then you know, I, I don't think they need to be referred if you can get the scan. I think the patients pay more though, is the problem. Yeah, it's marginal though, like the, uh, a private MRI is 250. Um, and, and if you send a patient and then they get referred by you, there's often a gap of 250 on the MRI. Yeah, okay. So, so, so there's probably not much. In, in which case, so for asymmetrical hearing loss, you know, I'll, I'll just, if you're comfortable, I'll just image if it's negative. Yeah. Um, and for pulse dial tinnitus, I probably would because the examination can be a bit complex. Yeah. You know, I'll normally scope yeah. the patient looking yeah. for a frang pharyngolaryngeal yeah. vascular anomalies yeah. and this sort of stuff. But even then, that's because I'm looking for it because I'm a head and neck surgeon. I think most ENT we put a scope down. They just do an MRI, MRI, MRV, and go tick. Yeah. You know, it's fine, and mostly it's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, and patients struggle with that. <clears throat> it's interesting pulse dial tinnitus because I think what happens is so when 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 you're younger, your carotid artery just goes essentially straight up, and when you're doing a neck dissection, there's very little tortuosity to that carotid artery, and I dissect it from skull base down to clavicle, but then you operate on an 80 year old. And the carotid artery goes does all sorts of funny things just through ectasia ex and, and weakness. So it, I've seen them. It goes up, back on itself, and up again. It does a one eighty as you can. Mm. And as that changes, you have to get turbulence. So with age, your carotid vasculature does change. You get turbulence, and you start hearing pulse dial tinnitus. Mm. And the blood pressure is fine. They've got nothing else that you can find. And they go, "Well, that's great, but I can hear this whooshing sound in my ear. I'm not making that up, and it's only on one side. Mm. And obviously, but the carotid vasculature is different on both sides." So on the right side, it's essentially, it, you know, it becomes, it, it, it's, 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 straight, it's straight off the carotid, um, the, the aortic arch on the left side, you know, it, it doesn't, it comes off and then, you know, so th there's all, it, it's a different pattern going up. So it's not the same angles um, and patients get quite frustrated with that, but also that means it, there's ongoing change. And with time, often that pulse tinnitus gets better, able to adapt to it, but also because, you know, the, the, the flow changes as well. It's really mm -hmm. interesting.
I, I think actually sometimes we'll refer just because um, the patient wants that second opinion as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they won't they won't take it from the GP, even if you've got a good relationship. It's so disabling that they want that um, opinion from from the specialist and from the doctor in the because yeah, and, and, and I, I would argue though yeah you're absolutely right and, and I, I see that all the time and my wife's a gp and, and you know unfortunately still sends me patients occasionally uh, for that reason um uh, but i think as a patient as well if you went to your gp and he said right this is my eight points and went through it you know there's always also is how you deal with that you know you can come across you know you've all got so many varied subspecialty interests um and tinnitus is, is hard to know where to start but if you've got a structured response um i think a lot of patients would actually buy into that and because they've got a much better relationship with their general practitioner than they do with some random specialist if you go through this and, and say right this is why we refer tick 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 most i think most patients would be pretty happy with that um and you probably find less needing to be referred i mean it takes a bit more uh, time because i think when they go to the nt specialist a lot of them get fobbed off anyway they just pay a big bill and they don't think they get a great service it's a harsh reality. Uh, does your website, uh, I haven't had a look at, yeah. at the website yet, does that, do you have just some um, patient level information regarding tinnitus that yeah. address those issues as well? Yeah, um, yeah, to a degree. I mean, it's got, it's, it's got a lot of, you know, frequently asked questions, which is ever expanding as I get asked more and more questions. I think the best tool is the YouTube channel, which is JC Hodge Tinnitus Treatment. Um, and that's, there might be like 30 videos on that, each about three minutes for you know, magnesium, mm. diet, noise, yep. sleep, you know, yep. and it's really, and that is geared entirely to patients. That's not geared towards, so it really is done in a way that's, um, that, you know, I think is quite understandable. Um, and that's probably a better overall holistic tinnitus tool for patients um whereas the website is geared very much towards sound therapy although it talks a lot about sleep and and, and other bits and pieces as well someone's just asking it does the masking technique work for pulsatile tinnitus um so yes uh, masking i mean uh, yes so the only sound therapy that really works for pulsatile tinnitus is is masking um because that will still increase your environmental sound so if they've got hearing loss um even though it's a self-generated sound having having competing external sound does help with it i don't think it's as effective as internal as as non-pulsatile um tinnitus but it is still quite effective and it's often one of the only tools you got in your box unless they're hypertensive and, and there's a bit of wiggle room in the blood pressure uh then yes it's good and you know so hearing aid during the day um you know in, in, in and say pink noise for me is definitely the key at night time i think it's a it's a fantastic underused tool which everyone can act because everyone's got most people got you know apple or, or or you know spotify and so essentially it's free other than your prescription and it's and it's really easy um yep so that's uh so that's what about dr jc hodge.com so that's a separate website so that's uh just a website i i that uh, that is self-promotional shall we say <laughs> so it tells you all about me which is awesome but probably not that useful for, for you or your patients <laughs> it's just um you know most people now when when they're looking for it so before it would very much go on gp recommendations so you go to gp you go who should i see and they go you should see this guy here he's awesome um or don't see this guy he's a, he's a, he's an idiot um but now patients often go well yeah that's fine but let's let, and they google you yeah and um and you know you look at your google reviews no people write those that, you know you yeah, don't have a good relationship with so you can so in, in this day and age now you need a decent website that actually goes through what you do your research what you offer your yeah. subspecialty interests and these sort of things because people do do look it up yeah is there any uh i've certainly had a number of patients coming in and i it just from my own impression really high frequency since it seems to have a closer correlation to to mental health base. is there any correlation yeah I, th th listen there isn't any but i've had that same uh, observation it's it's um it's a really irritating sound so when i was there's something about it that just really upsets patients which is why i like pink noise because you can have this so there's another noise called red noise which is high frequency and then backwards and and i tried that on, on patients and they're just not happy uh, when, I, when I was, it's interesting because you can't, so my, I've got a little bit of hearing loss, so I don't hear the high frequencies as well anymore, like most patients. 
and I was in a uh, we were in a in a rental because we were we were renovating our house and we had four kids and the dog and my wife. And I was sitting in bed in a fairly small apartment and I was going through all the various frequency treatment sounds to make sure they're harmonious because I didn't want people to listen to stuff that was awful. And I got to about nine kilohertz and I couldn't hear it. So I whacked up the volume as high as I could. And the dog was howling and my wife was, you know, and, and they thought it was the, because they could all hear it. Was, you know, my kids could hear it. They thought it was the fridge. I can hear the freezer open, closing, oh, my headphones, you know, and I'm just, I don't know what's going on. I'm not really paying attention. And then eventually everyone comes into the room and wife's going, what the, <laughs> what are you doing? And they're telling me, well, nothing, I can't hear anything. And the dog was going bananas. Like it was really unhappy. And I think that, that, that you know, it's just a very distressing sound high frequency. And it also is interesting, it affects your hearing. So I've had a few patients, we fix their presbyacusis because you got rid of the, you know, because they've got rid of the tinnitus and suddenly they can hear again because they're doing the hearing test. He gets to eight hertz, you've got this yeek, and you can't tell whether it's that or your tinnitus. And so you're sort of not scoring it properly. So it looks like you've got central neural high frequency age-related hearing, but you haven't, you've just got bad tinnitus and you fix the tinnitus and the hearing gets better. Just, just absolutely remarkable. Hmm. All right, that was great, JC. Thanks so much no, for your pleasure. time this evening. Any, any more questions, guys, before we uh, call it an evening? If you come up with anything, just, just flick it across. And I'll, if you send me an email, then I'll put it. Yeah, easy done. Yeah. I think it's just great to have an alternative. It's somewhere that we can direct, because I think a lot of these patients do, as you outlined mm. at the start, do feel like they're <laughs> dismissed, not just by specialists, but also by general practitioners, because we're limited in what we've yeah. been able to offer yeah. historically often there asking for benzodiazepines and other drugs that we don't want to uh, deliver, yeah. but they feel we're not offering anything alternative. Yeah. So having something that's evidence-based and uh, uh, TGA approved and, and uh, the yeah. evidence that it works, having an alternative, I think is yeah. something we definitely want to uh, spread amongst our network. Yeah, and, e and even just that framework to work through with patients, I think that's great. So I'll make sure we get that and I'll send it out to all the clinics. Um, but no, thanks so much for your time again, no, JC. No, that no, was, no, that no, was no, great. Thank you. And uh, we'll uh, call that an evening, guys, and we'll catch up soon.